very, uh, very exciting to take part in, in terms of the different time zones and sort of speakers. Um, but yeah, and so, you know, thank you for having me. Uh, so this, this work is uh, joint with my advisor, Pierre Alaba, and, uh, and this picture I just sort of wanted to show because I think it's a cool depiction. So this is an image of the, the wavefront of the geodesic flow um, in the Heisenberg group. So, you know, sort of already you, you can kind of see some interesting geometry in this sort of setting that may be a bit newer for some spectral geometers, um, but, you know, Hopefully we'll see some familiar things as well. Um, so the first thing, you know, uh, since a lot of the talk will focus on the, the Hodge Laplacian, it's always nice to start with something very familiar, which is classical Hodge theory. Um, so we know that we have a you know a differential cochain complex uh, just induced from the sort of smooth structure on a closed Riemannian manifold. We can construct this collection of vector spaces, which are you know, the quotient of the image of the exterior differential by, or the kernel by the image of the previous map. Uh, with a Riemannian metric, we can uh, construct a sort of dual co-differential map. And with that, the kind of familiar um, elliptic hodge laplacian And so it's work of sort of Hodge and Vile to some degree to fix the original proof. We'll prove that sort of for any choice of metric, uh, the space of uh, differential p forms admits this orthogonal decomposition into the these different linear subspaces and the kernel of this operator actually is is topological so i i like to sort of interpret this classical result as saying that you know the, the zero eigenspace of the laplacian on forms is a uh, you know topological invariant similarly um, some other kind of familiar sort of classical results uh, involve the heat kernel um, so the you know fundamental solution to this uh, linear PDE that we saw a bit already um, in Ingrid's talk uh, for positive values of t uh, as a parameter uh, is a trace class operator and admits this sort of singular expansion in t uh, you know uh, with this kind of fixed order um, the sort of really surprising result about this classical fact is that, you know, all the coefficients as we saw in the previous talk admit these sort of familiar expressions as various sort of universal polynomials in the, uh, the germ of the metric near a point. Um, so in particular, we can view this as sort of relating the geometry to the, uh, to the analysis of this operator. Um, and one thing I wanted to highlight also is that, you know, a, a really crude topological invariant that's recovered by the heat kernel is just the dimension, right? Sort of floating throughout all of these expansions is the order of the operator. Um, and I highlight that just to say that this dimension will also change in sort of the singular setting we're looking at. So kind of the new thing for a lot of members of the audience will be this input of sub geometry, where on a smooth manifold, um, I begin with a, uh, a sub-bundle of the tangent bundle satisfying the so-called bracket generating condition, i.e. If you, if you were to begin with a, a vector field in this, uh, you know, sort of preferred sub-bundle H, uh, iterated brackets of that vector field or vector uh, other vectors in it um, will span the tangent bundle. So, you, you know, you can sort of view the statement as saying that uh, any, uh, any vector field on my manifold can be written as a sum of some finite number of brackets of vector fields uh, tangent to this sub-bundle H. So the, the sort of geometric assumption we're going to be working with throughout is the so-called equiregular case. Um, this is slightly different from Hermander because he didn't assume this condition when he first sort of began to study this, but um, this will make it a bit easier to sort of see how some of the topology comes into play. Um, in particular, with this choice of subbundle H and a norm on that subbundle, you can also define a sort of degenerate distance function, which is sort of defined to be the usual distance. You know, take uh, curves which connect two points, but the added assumption we'll make is that they have to remain tangent to the subbundle, and then just infamize over such curves. Um, you know, infamize over their lengths. Um, 
and the, the kind of motivation for this bracket generating condition for Hormonder is that it gives you um, a, a kind of generalization of ellipticity to a so-called sub-elliptic or hypoelliptic operator. So, you know, a, um, a kind of non-quantitative version of his results could be viewed as the following. You know, if you begin with a local frame for the sub-bundle and some distribution, um, you know, a, a distributional solution of a kind of simplified Laplacian uh, is, is automatically smooth, right? So if, say, M was the manifold of dimension M, um, this, uh, you know, this K is a, you know, the rank of the subbundle H is strictly lower than the dimension of the manifold. So this is not something that you would typically expect to give this smoothing condition. And to some degree, it's, uh, you know, it's because of this kind of bracket generating results, you know. Um, essentially, vector fields that aren't tangent to H, you can uh, obtain those vector fields if you're willing to uh, replace a given vector field that was, say, orthogonal to H with one that was a sum of sufficiently many, uh, you know, Lie brackets. Um, so, you know, now to get a bit more specific, you know, kind of the motivation for this are what are going to be these so-called compatible Riemannian metrics. So in this case, now we're going to specialize in the case of a contact manifold. In this case, uh, I am going to begin with a closed manifold of some dimension M. Uh, it has a subbundle H, which is um, given as globally in the kernel of a smooth one form theta. And I'm going to consider Riemannian metrics of this form, which where I have some kind of degenerate submetric on the subbundle H plus, uh, you know, theta dot theta. So this is going to give me a Riemannian metric on the whole manifold. Um, and, you know, this picture off to the side is uh, a kind of nice visualization of the Hoff vibration for the three sphere, right? So uh, if you've seen this uh, vibration of S3, uh, it's a map down to the two sphere and the pre-image of each point has one of these circle fibers. So what you should view that circle as being is that this one form theta is a line element on any of those fibers, uh, on any of those circles. And it can be a measure of the length of a vector field tangent to that circle. Um, in particular, we're going to consider a sort of parametrized version of this. So now we have a family of metrics with this parameter epsilon. Um, you know, if I were to give you a normal Riemannian metric, you could write down the length of uh, you know, the distance between two points with the usual geodesic distance. But now I have this parametrized family of distances and in epsilon as a metric space, uh, this is a result sort of first observed by Gromov. Uh, it, these metric spaces converge in gromov hausdorff distance to the original Subramanian uh, distance that I defined just on the other slide. So, um, you know, this sort of begs the natural question, which is, if I have kind of convergence of metric spaces in this very, you know, rough sense of gromov hausdorff how do, you know, Riemannian objects, i.e. things I can define with the Laplace spectrum of this metric, how do those behave in this limit? And so you can, you know, on the picture of this three sphere, what you can imagine that this limit does is when epsilon gets smaller and smaller, I am penalizing this part of the metric and it measures a tangent vector, which is tangent to one of those circles as getting larger and larger in norm. So sort of geometrically, these circle fibers are kind of getting unbounded in radius. Um, this is very closely related to something that's studied in both other parts of spectral geometry and in physics called the adiabatic limit, where you could sort of imagine the opposite behavior. Instead of letting one of these circles get very large, I start to sort of collapse the fibers. Um, and this, this might be a, a, a picture you're sort of more familiar with. Um, this adiabatic limit is especially going to be of use because um, it was sort of studied by uh, Matteo and Melrose in a similar context. But, um, you know, sort of before I get much further, I just want to say, you know, there's an enormous literature on heat kernels in both contact geometry and in Subramanian geometry more generally. Um, you know, I'm listing just a few authors that have worked on this, and a few I really want to highlight are some of these, especially sort of the ones in red are uh, work that, you know, will sort of be directly relevant in this talk. Um, but if you're sort of curious about any of this, I'd be happy to, you know, 
suggest some other references. Um, so, you know, to just sort of warm up, we can kind of think of what happens with the Laplacian on functions, right? Um, in this case, uh, for that family of metrics we had, uh, there, there will be sort of a nice decomposition for the scalar Laplacian into a hypoelliptic operator as Hermander studied, plus um, uh, a, uh, a uh, first or uh, second order operator only involving the derivatives of this um, direction that were sort of tangent to the fibers. I should say briefly some terminology. Um, the vector field that's uh, dual to this one form in this metric uh, in contact geometry is referred to the, the Reb vector field. So I'll use that word a lot. So in particular, you sort of, you know, you can wonder what happens to this elliptic operator. Well, I have this, you know, positive family of elliptic operators that are dominating this hypoelliptic operator in this limit. So um, this is sort of enough to get kind of crude statements about the spectrum. Um, you know, the, the eigenfunctions of this uh, operator will uh, converge at least weakly in L2 to the eigenfunctions of this operator. But for the heat equation, something sort of more subtle arises, which is um, if I were to let this limit go to zero and then consider the small time heat asymptotics, there's this kind of jump in dimension that occurs. Um, this is uh, a phenomenon that happens a lot in Subramanian geometry where for the sort of degenerate object, you can still write down some spectral quantity, but you have an increase in the dimension related to the, the Hausdorff dimension associated to your Subramanian structure. It's typically larger than the, the topological dimension you begin with. So this is kind of our first um, you know, window into some of the subtleties that can happen. Um, so now let's, you know, let's talk about forms now that we've seen some of this already. Uh, and again, you know, please interrupt me if anything arises. Uh, so we should say there's a slight typo here. So not only is choice of plane field, but the fact that we've chosen this uh, one form theta, we admit a splitting on the space of differential forms. So, uh, you know, any P form I can decompose into those which are the P wedges of uh, one forms that are dual to the subbundle H with respect to the, the submetric G sub H. And then those which are, you know, have some theta component to them and are wedged with, uh, you know, P minus one sort of horizontal forms. So this splitting on the space of forms, you know, it also induces a splitting at the level of the exterior differential. Um, and you can write the, you can write D in this way. So on the diagonal, it has the sort of horizontal differential. Um, you, can, you could sort of write that in terms of if you were to take the usual differential, one way you might write it in coordinates is to differentiate with respect to a vector and then wedge with its dual. Um, and in this case, you just do that for all of your horizontal vectors, you know, tangent to the subbundle H with respect to some choice of local frame. Uh, it's the off-diagonal terms that are sort of more interesting in this case. So on this kind of uh, lower left, we'll have this appearance of the Reb vector field. And the upper right is a zeroth order operator, which is just wedge with d theta. Um, and this is referred to as the almost Lefschetz operator because it satisfies a similar role as the, the Lefschetz operator in Kähler geometry. Um, uh, so now, uh, in this case, we're, we're going to introduce this parameter and we want to sort of study what is happening to the, you know, analysis of our operator. You could do that by, say, studying a space of a family of Hilbert spaces, or instead you could sort of introduce the parameter as a, uh, a part of the geometry of your underlying manifold. So instead of the original manifold M, we'll now consider this manifold X, which has the epsilon parameter as a kind of interval and we are going to change the smooth structure on our tangent bundle by what's sometimes called rescaling over the, the hypersurface given by uh, the you know, boundary epsilon equal to zero. So you can consider um, a, a Lie subalgebra of all of the vector fields on this uh, you know, parameterized manifold X 
and only consider those for which the um, uh, push forward by the epsilon projection map is trivial. So in other words, these vector fields are sort of independent of the epsilon parameter, which is good because this parameter is sort of a, a dummy variable we're introducing. That's kind of the first thing we'd want to assume. And the second thing we want to bake into this definition of vector fields is that at the kind of boundary where epsilon is zero, we want these vector fields to have uh, degenerated to ones which are tangent to the subbundle H. And these sort of vector fields are going to be crucial to our, um, to our construction. Uh, now, um, uh, the next thing we can do is we can construct a vector bundle, uh, which is, uh, you know, where the phrase rescaling the original vector bundle comes from, such that it's the sections of this bundle are um, precisely this kind of subalgebra of vector fields that are defined in this new way. So now where before we had a family of Hilbert spaces, instead we can work on this new manifold and a new vector bundle such that uh, the exterior differential depends on the parameter epsilon as it would a smooth coordinate. So instead of you know degenerating Hilbert spaces, we've replaced this as a problem where we have degenerating operators. And kind of it, it sort of shifts some of the focus so that we can think of it a bit more geometrically. But if you know if that's kind of too high-minded, you can just view it as um, we have a, a family of metrics and both our exterior differential and the co-differential have singular coefficients. But otherwise, it has the same sort of expression as an operator. Um, so I should stop for a second and ask, sort of, are there any questions or um, are people comfortable with this so far? Everything is good okay. so far. Great. So if we have, you know, sort of our now singular differential operators, we can again sort of ask what happens to the Hodge Laplacian? Um, and, you know, sort of heuristically, we can expect what might occur if we were to just take these two, you know, sort of add these operators and square them. And we can, you know, try and decompose what are the different uh, components of this operator in terms of how singular are they in this epsilon coefficient. So if we begin with the eigenvalue problem, um, you know, naively what we'd expect is that for the uh, eigenform and eigenvalue to exist in this limit, the first thing we would want to assume is that this eigenform was in the kernel of the most singular part of the operator and was to some degree an eigenform of this, um, you know, this uh, differential operator. And here's where the, the bracket generating condition is really going to help us because, um, you know, by Hormander's theorem, that'll uh, ensure that this, you know, Nabla sub H is hypoelliptic, so it also has discrete spectrum with a complete set of eigenforms. And you know, again, we had the kind of scalar phenomena where um, you know, th this term was sort of just uh, vanishingly non-contributing in the limit. Um, so the other sort of uh, insightful thing about this is that the, the kernel of this zeroth order operator, which I'm going to denote as L squared, um, it already had some uh, it already had some geometric meaning as the so-called Brumann complex. So this this diabatic limit was first studied by uh, Michel Brumann, who uh, introduced the kernel of this operator sort of for other motivations than the one I'm considering. Um, so you know let's let's recall his definition really quickly. So the Brumann complex is a differential co-chain complex. Um, it kind of div divides itself into two pieces. So there's sort of a lower half and an upper half of the complex. The lower half is just, I mean, the, the whole thing you can view as being just take the usual Durham complex and then intersect it with the kernel of this endomorphism. Um, since this endomorphism is a uh, constant spectrum, you know, that you'll get still a well-behaved uh, complex in this case. But the lower half is explicitly some quotient of the Durham complex, and the upper half is actually a, a, a subcomplex. So you know, you, you can get even more explicit if you'd like. The only thing that's a bit unusual is how do you go from the quotient to the subcomplex, 
And there's this kind of non-trivial connecting differential called D, which is actually a second order differential operator. Um, so the interesting thing about you know, all the kind of differentials of this complex is that they are all horizontal differential operators. They kind of, they only differentiate uh, along the subbundle H. Um, but to you know, connect the two halves of this complex, you need to uh, take at least two derivatives uh, horizontally. And you know, that's sort of, you know, secretly there are some commutators hiding in that. Uh, you know, to connect these two halves of complex, you'll need to take a, a you know, sort of a Reb derivative, which is orthogonal to your subundal H. And you do that by instead replacing that, uh, uh, that Reb derivative with, you know, some number of commutators. The nice thing, um, so when Ruman introduced this complex, he also proved a version of the, the Hodge theorem for it. So if you were to introduce just a, um, a submetric, uh, you can define, uh, you know, a co-differential to these horizontal uh, differential DQs. You can define Laplacians of this complex sort of in the way that you might expect. And they are isomorphic to the cohomology as a complex, which itself is also isomorphic to the singular cohomology of your manifold, and hence the Hodge complex, the, the um, you know, zero eigenspace of the Hodge Laplacian. So again, this complex is sort of, uh, its zero eigenspace is also uh, containing some topological content. Um, the, other th the other sort of nice result of Ramans is that he was able to show what happens to the spectrum in the limit, um, at least for sort of compact subsets of the spectrum. So what he proved was that on a closed contact manifold, there, ad uh, there exist sort of uh, subspaces of L2 forms such that when you project onto them, the resolvent of the Hodge Laplacian converges an operator norm to the resolvent of the, uh, the horizontal sub Laplacians, Nabla Q, uh, at least outside of the sort of um, form degrees where you were in the middle, right? So if, uh, if my manifold was, of, uh, was an odd dimensional manifold of dimension 2n plus 1, the kind of middle dimension arising here is distinct because D had a different differential order. Um, so you have a slightly different result in the sort of middle degrees. First of all, you need to rescale the resolvent. Um, and in that case, the resolvent converges uh, in operator norm to the resolvent of D star D. So this is a bit surprising for sort of several reasons. One is that if you had to rescale uh, the resolvent in this way, then the original spectrum was already collapsing. You know, the um, eigenforms of this Laplacian were sort of going to zero at order epsilon squared. But when you rescale by that epsilon parameter, they now converge to the uh, spectrum of uh, an, uh, an operator of higher order. And this kind of is uh, somewhat contradictory in terms of Weyl's law, sort of what you might expect naively. So this, um, this is uh, really helpful if you're studying spectral invariance because you now have statements about local spectral convergence, right? You know, kind of any compact subset of the uh, spectrum of the Hodge Laplacian, it's going to converge on that compact subset to this, um, this hypoelliptic operator. But you, you could never hope for the whole thing to occur because the dimensions or the differential orders aren't matching up, right? You know, the the vial law for the counting function, uh, you know, depends on the differential order in this way for a second order elliptic operator. But in this case, for a hyperelliptic operator of higher order, it's, you know, slightly different. So there's, there's kinds of all sorts of subtleties going on in the spectrum when you consider this limit. Um, and, you know, what this means, unfortunately, is that since we have two limits that we're interested in between letting the metrics converge um, to this sort of degenerate submetric, or considering the small time heat asymptotics, you know, you, you can never hope to sort of resolve this issue, which is uh, a bit problematic if you're interested in studying kinds of global spectral invariants, such as analytic torsion. 
Um, so torsion is, is sort of an interesting object. It was um, introduced initially by uh, Ray and Singer to be uh, a spectral analog of uh, a very subtle topological invariant called the Reitemeister torsion. Um, so the way that you compute this invariant is you say, if I were to take the normal Durham complex and uh, consider some flat vector bundle E, I can twist the Durham complex by that vector bundle and then compute the log determinant of the Hodge Laplacian and then consider this alternating sum of those log determinants. In this case, you, you need to define the log determinant via some uh, sort of a, a zeta regularization, right? So the, the first thing you would want to do is start with this identity that's sort of valid in, uh, for finite positive real numbers, where the, the log of the determinant is equal to this derivative of a zeta function. And then I can re-express that derivative of a zeta function as this Mellon transform of the heat trace. So if you understand the heat kernel very well, then you can compute the determinant. Uh, other spectral invariants that uh, one might be interested in that are sort of more global and depend on all of the spectrum at once is the eta invariant, which was uh, first introduced by Atiyah, Patodi, and Singer as a, a geometric contribution to the a Tia Singer index theorem on a manifold with boundary. So in this case, the, the eta invariant um, is a, a spectral invariant of the so-called signature operator acting on um, sort of a, uh, only the space of even forms. And in this case, it's the, um, this you know, slightly modified heat operator. But again, you know, sort of if, you, if you understand the, the heat kernel of your original uh, in this case, Dirac operator very well, um, then you can also study the, uh, the eta invariant in sort of a similar fashion. And so that, that was sort of the main project. Um, you know, the main goal of this project was to kind of study what are these global invariants doing in this limit? Um, and so one thing is that we, um, you know, we, we give new proofs of Raman's results. Um, essentially by leveraging some topological insights initially due to the, the analog with the case of the adiabatic limit due to Matseo and Melrose, where you consider the collapsing the fibers of some fiber bundle, uh, as well as some blow-up constructions. And the, the way that the proof sort of proceeds is by just directly constructing the Schwartz kernel of the heat propagator. And so um, some of the results that we gain is that um, the, the result you might hope to be true essentially is, which is that the log determinant of the sub-elliptic operator is equal to just the finite part in epsilon of the log determinant of the Hodge-Laplacian. So you know, what that involves also showing that there is a, a Taylor expansion in epsilon, which is sort of sufficiently regular for the determinant. And that when you take the finite part of that expansion, it differs only from the log determinant by uh, you know, a, a sort of local kind of uh, universal polynomial depending on the contact geometry. And the, a similar result is true for the eta invariant. So kind of both of these operators are, you can view them as being kind of contact versions of the, the heat invariants. Although in this case, instead of depending on the Riemannian metric, they depend on uh, kind of fundamentally contact geometric objects, what's known as the, the Tano connection, um, as well as the, the torsion, because unlike the Levi-Civita connection, the kind of natural connection in contact geometry has, uh, has torsion as an affine connection. Um, uh, unfortunately, it's, it's a bit difficult to determine these polynomials, kind of in practice, similarly with the, um, you know, the, the usual heat invariants. Um, but we have sort of strong suspicion that in other sub settings, aside from the contact case, uh, the, those coefficients uh, don't arise. So these, these quantities are actually equal. Um, and the way that this sort of is proved more directly is by obtaining this uh, kind of uh, at this asymptotic result for what are the different expansions of the heat trace. 
So you can kind of view these as being sort of three different asymptotic regimes for the heat kernel, depending on the, the time and the epsilon parameter. So, you know, this first one shouldn't be surprising because it's the, the previous heat trace expansion we were considering. You know, for any fixed positive epsilon, this is still going to be some elliptic operator. And as t goes to zero, it has the usual heat trace expansions. Um, if I fix time instead and I let epsilon go to zero, what I get is that up to something little o of one, I obtain the heat trace of the sub Laplacian. And then in the kind of joint regime, I have a smooth expansion in terms of what are again kind of universal polynomials in the tunnel connection. And the row to the zero term contributes precisely this. Um, this universal quantity, that integral. Um, but, you know, this was only sort of for the case where you are outside of form degrees, kind of in the middle of the complex. Um, in, uh, in middle degree, there's actually a, a whole new asymptotic regime because there's more subtlety to the, uh, to the spectral phenomena. You, if you remember, we had this problem of small eigenvalues where um, some some eigenforms collapsed to zero in the limit. And in fact, actually, if you remember those, those uh, collapsing eigenforms were in correspondence with eigenforms of the, the sub-elliptic fourth order operator. So you actually have an infinite family of small eigenvalues. Um, in, in spectral geometry, that's usually uh, you know, a nightmarish uh, problem, but sort of luckily you can identify all of those small eigenvalues as coming from something topologically. So you can sort of still obtain a result of this type where, as before, you have the Riemannian regime, the kind of sub-Riemannian regime, <clears throat> and then two joint expansions, depending on whether you allow t and epsilon to go to zero, either at the same rate or at a slightly uh, you know, staggered rate. And so this, uh, this is going to correspond to the previous expansion, hence the sort of same coefficients, that they actually have the same expressions. And then here you have this new contribution coming from uh, the sort of rescaled limits of what would be the collapsing eigenforms. So that's, that's sort of the, the main statements of the, um, of the paper. Um, now we can talk a bit about how, you, how we do this, but I guess maybe before I continue, I should ask, you know, are there any questions again or? Are people fine with this so far? That's an, I have a naive question. Are there other regimes which are not covered by, by this? Uh, no. So okay. um, you, you might expect that maybe because you have uh, small eigenforms that the large time uh, regime would be relevant, but that's sort of accompanied in this, um, in this case, uh, simply because you you replace the usual heat trace with one in which you have rescaled the Hodge Laplacian. So, you know, what, what would have been kind of large T, you can bring into finite time by rescaling T over epsilon squared. Um, Thank and, you. And there aren't any other regimes. No, thanks for asking. But yeah, the, the sort of main idea for how you do this again is to introduce these blow ups, which is if there, if there is some kind of fundamental um, lack of uniformity between the two limits of t and epsilon, what you want to do is sort of consider the trace of the heat kernel as a function on this, um, uh, you know, first quadrant in the t epsilon plane. And if the only sort of singularity is at the origin, you want to blow up the origin and introduce this new boundary face. So, you know, th this sort of axis is square root t, this axis is epsilon. So our previous regimes where say t is going to zero and epsilon is strictly positive, you want to imagine is some, uh, you know, some collection of straight lines, you know, coming into this original origin. Um, you know, and similarly, the sort of the sub Ramanian limit would instead be, you have a collection of lines converging this way. And there's sort of this issue where they collide. When you blow up the corner, you um, you know sort of give yourself a bit more freedom, and the uh, the, the the heat kernel is being is going to be constructed on a kind of blown up space of this type. 
um, the, the different boundary faces themselves are going to correspond to the different asymptotics. So, you know, in this case, you know, this boundary face corresponds to what were the, the usual Riemannian, uh, you know, heat asymptotics. These are the sub Riemannian ones and the kind of universal polynomial is going to come in from this new face. Um, now, you know, how do you do this in practice? Because, you know, if you just say, well, you do some blowups, it's not really very enlightening. So the, the kind of nice way to, uh, nice thing about this is that um, it's, it's to a large degree very much just a, a modern interpretation of the uh, classical construction of the Hadamard parametrix, right? Where if you want to study the heat kernel, you try and understand its Schwartz kernel, which is going to arise as this sort of integral operator. Um, and so in this case, you'll construct an approximation to the true heat kernel, you know, for the, for the heat equation, this would be zero, but instead we'll allow some error, which is going to be small in appropriate sense. Um, and you begin with the sort of ansatz, which is that for positive T or points which are sufficiently separated, um, it's reasonable to approximate the heat equation with just the Euclidean heat kernel. So in other words, introduce coordinates near the, the diagonal of your product, right? My, my parametrix is going to be a function of t and two spatial coordinates. And on my manifold y cross y, except for near the, the diagonal at time zero, this is a perfectly well-behaved function. And it's only singular on this submanifold. So we'll blow up that submanifold and try and see how does this differ from what would be the true heat kernel, and in that way construct our parametrix. So now to, to say how we blow up a submanifold, all you need to do is sort of follow this procedure, which is a bit different from the, what algebraic geometers imagine when they hear the phrase blow up. So if you give me some smooth manifold M, uh, in, in this case, we'll assume uh, if it's uh, a manifold with boundary, we'll say that uh, the submanifold has to meet the boundary in a certain prescribed way. Take the uh, embedded submanifold, and the blow up of it will be just uh, removing that submanifold and replacing it with the inward pointing spherical normal bundle, which is going to be uh, a submanifold of one lower dimension, and it'll sort of arise as kind of a new boundary. So, in the case of our picture, if this is the product y and we have our time parameter r tau, where I've kind of forcefully uh, taken the square root of t, um, then the blow up of this manifold is going to have this sort of new structure where this was the, the boundary face that replaced what used to be this embedded submanifold. In particular, this, um, this blowdown map beta, except for on a measure zero set given by this boundary face, this is, uh, you know, essentially the nicest map possible because it's a, uh, it's a diffeomorphism. You know, it's, it's the identity away from this measure zero set. So it makes sense to take coordinates on my original manifold and pull them back along this map beta. Similarly, if I had a vector field which was defined on this manifold, I could pull it back along beta to the interior and on this dense subset defined by continuity how it restricts to the boundary face. So to sort of show you what this looks like in coordinates, um, you know, on my new uh, blown up manifold in a neighborhood of S plus, uh, nice coordinates for the spherical normal bundle, this new boundary face um, would be tau and uh, this fiber coordinate zeta. So I know how to pull back um, coordinates. And similarly, if I were to take vector fields, I can pull them back. And on this boundary face, they restrict to um, constant coefficient vector fields uh, only depending on the fiber variable. So I can start with the usual heat operator, which is ultimately just locally a polynomial and some vector fields, and look at what do those vector fields pull back to, and hence what does the differential operator pull back to. And on the boundary face S plus Y, I now have this much simpler constant coefficient differential operator. 
So my onsatz was that away from this boundary face, this would be sort of a, a useful approximation to the heat kernel, maybe times some cutoff, which is exponentially decaying as I get further from this diagonal. And to correct it on the new boundary face, I'm solving a series of, uh, you know, ODEs, you know, depending only on the simpler differential operator. So, you know, iteratively, we can construct the solutions to those equations and then um, sum them asymptotically to obtain what will be the, the parametrics, uh, which will give us uh, some remainder term, R infinity, which is decaying to infinite order as we approach this new boundary face, S plus Y. Uh, so finally, to get our sort of parametrics, we um, view this, uh, this asymptotic sum of the solutions to this iterative set of uh, constant coefficient PDEs as a convolution operator. Um, and we can get the sort of true heat kernel by observing that as a convolution operator, this parametrix G infinity satisfies this equation, which is identity plus one over T R infinity, which was already decaying to infinite order. And this I can now invert with some Neumann series because this term R um, you know, was decaying to sufficiently high order. So it's, um, it's something which I can also push down. So this is how I would construct the heat kernel, um, you know, sort of if I was, uh, you know, going to do it in this way via blowups. The nice thing about it though, is that um, this is a very flexible construction because you can, um, you can in particular introduce various singular boundaries, right? So, you know, I had the boundary tau equals zero. Um, in our sort of framework, we are also introducing an extra boundary given by the epsilon equals zero face. So we have a few extra um, boundaries that are introduced when we blow them up. And we have just a few extra kind of asymptotic series of uh, constant coefficient PDEs to solve. Um, so the sort of only thing that's really remaining is to determine what boundary, um, what boundary submanifold, what submanifold should we be blowing up and sort of in what way. And this is sort of where the, some of the topology comes into place. You know, we're, you know, again, uh, we're, we're going to look to the, the adiabatic limit where you were considering these collapsing fibers. And in this case, um, this was sort of taken up first by uh, Matsuo and Melrose, where they considered a, a fiber bundle uh, with compact fiber and base and a family of degenerate metrics similar to ours. In this case, though, you know, for us, the, the epsilon parameter would have been on this part of the metric. Here it was, you know, over there. So, uh, you know, th this sort of goes back to, are you letting the circle fibers get large? Or in this case, are you kind of crushing them off? And in this case, what Matteo and Melrose were studying were how do harmonic forms uh, with respect to this family of metrics decay? Um, and in their case, the, the topology came in via a, a sort of spectral sequence. Um, and, and in this case, the, the other kind, right? Not, the, not a collection of eigenvalues, but in the sense of algebraic topology. But the nice thing about it is that this is maybe the most analyst friendly spectral sequence that you can imagine because it's uh, the, the so-called pages of the spectral sequence occur by just looking at what forms on, uh, on the manifold M admit a, you know, a, a finite polynomial expansion such that they have sufficiently high epsilon decay in, uh, as a form on X. So, you know, in this case, the nth page of the spectral sequence is going to be any form on M which admits an extension to X. Sorry, apologies for the typo, such that the extended form has nth order vanishing when you hit it with the, the Hobbes Laplacian. So the, the reason why they introduced this spectral sequence via Hodge theory was that um, it, when you give me a, a fiber bundle, um, it automatically induces a filtration on the space of forms. Um, and that filtration is by saying, if I were to 
if I were to consider um, a P form, uh, you know, what, what, is the, what is the associated weight of that form according to how many horizontal components does it have versus vertical? Um, so if you, if you filter your Durham complex uh, by the horizontal weight, you get separately the so-called hodge lorey spectral sequence. Um, it's sort of a, a result of algebraic topology kind of classically going back to, you know, Lorey, that the, the Lorey spectral sequence of this fiber bundle converges to the usual Durham cohomology. But the surprising thing is that this Hodge theoretic spectral sequence, it also degenerates to in sort of finite time. And it also converges to the Hodge Lorey spectral sequence. So we, we can sort of you know, study this, um, we can study uh, iteratively vanishing forms of higher and higher order as we approach this epsilon to the zero boundary and retain the topological character of the Durham complex. Since the Durham complex was isomorphic to the, uh, the Riemann complex, which was the zero eigenspace of the sub Laplacians, we can sort of naively wonder whether we can also get the, the um, you know, recover the topology of our contact manifold via this kind of asymptotic uh, Hodge theory. So in our case, we're sort of wondering, you know, can we asymptotically solve Laplace's equation to higher and higher order? We sort of naively mimic um, Matteo and Melrose's definitions for these spectral sequences. Um, and we, we start to see a few things jump out at us. Kind of the first is that, um, you know, since our Hodge Laplacian was singular in the limit, uh, to just be sort of a non singular form, we need to automatically be in the kernel of the leading order part of the singular term in the Hodge Laplacian, which was this operator L. If we recall, though, that was the Riemann complex. So this is sort of promising. What it tells us is that the first page of this spectral sequence was the Riemann complex that already arose in the, uh, in the spectral theory of this degenerate metric limit. If we sort of continue, what we end up getting is a series of conditions on any form such that we can ensure that they have higher and higher order vanishing as they're approaching this epsilon equals zero boundary. Um, uh, a similar result to Matteo and Melrose is true, which is that this spectral sequence terminates and recovers the usual, um, uh, you know, Riemann cohomology. So, in particular, the space of all differential p-forms admit this kind of uh, a orthogonal decomposition in terms of what would be the pages of the spectral sequence. If we have this, um, you know, filtration by pages we can look at the associated graded and get a proper orthogonal decomposition, which suggests that, at least naively, if my space of forms decomposes orthogonally in this way, I should be able to decompose the identity into uh, the different projections onto these um, subspaces. And hopefully, the heat operator should uh, decompose as well. And this gives you sort of a framework for what you should expect the different asymptotic regimes of the heat operator to be. And that's kind of precisely what we see. There's sort of a purely algebraic part, which is just the, the large part of the Riemann complex. There's the, the second order horizontal regime and the fourth order horizontal regime, where again, there's some scaling between T and epsilon squared. Um, this is just sort of a schematic picture. And the way that you can make this precise is by saying, take your space where you have the two boundaries, tau equals zero and epsilon equals zero, and blow them up in such a way that you're blowing up in the usual sense on the horizontal subbundle and uh, so-called parabolic blow up with respect to the, um, the red vector field. So I'll just say briefly, these are the sort of um, manifolds with corners you end up constructing to study the the heat equation of the Hodge Laplacian in the form degrees outside of n and n plus one 
And when you're in n and n plus one, you have you know new boundary faces. You'll end up getting new um, constant coefficient PDEs you need to solve. But all of those solutions glue together to obtain the asymptotic regimes you expect. So you know sort of all of these different asymptotic regimes are just by computing the the trace of the operator on this blown up space. And uh, I, I recognize that I'm a bit over, so uh, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for this very nice talk. Uh, let's...